the, the, the stories come from an African heritage and they are one of the rich veins of American folklore and we are indebted to Joel Chandler Harris, an Atlanta newspaper man, who set down the speech of the black people uh, and he lived, of course, at a time when uh, the speech was still uh, close to the speech of the plantation blacks. And uh, the, the, this is the source of Uncle Remus stories. And you, when you read African folklore, you see that the same motifs, the same uh, plots, occur uh, in the early African legends and stories. And then the Uncle Rima stories is the result of what has happened to those stories when they have been transmuted by the blacks of, a, of, a, of America. Uh, for a while, I did not tell these stories. I, I used to know several of them. And I didn't tell them because some of the black uh, friends of mine uh, objected. They, they, they uh, were suspicious of anything that smacked of slavery days, and they felt that it denigrated the, the black people. But now I think there's, they have changed a bit in their attitude, and they, f they begin to realize that this is really a, a beautiful, source of wit and a marvelous art form and uh, really a, a priceless treasure that we have from the blacks. Uh, this is one of the Uncle Remus stories. Well, sir, one day when Br'er Bar and Br'er Coon and Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox was all clearing the new land for to plant a roasting year patch. The sun gun to get kind of hot. And Br'er Rabbit, he get mighty tired. But he don't want to let on, cause he's scared the balance of him would call him lazy. So he kept on toting off the brush and piling up the trash. And by and by he holler out, he say, I got a bra on my hand. And he lit out. He says to himself, I speck I'm going to find me a cool spot to take a little rest in. So off he went, and bomb by, he comes on a well. Now you know when you come to a well where the bucket's hanging high, you know, honey, that there's probably another bucket at the other end of the rope. And when one bucket goes up, the other goes down. But Br'er Rabbit, he don't give that no never mind. He just see the bucket and he says to himself, says he, that look cool. And cool I spec she is. And with that he jump in the bucket. And he ain't no sooner got himself fixed than the bucket gun to go down. Honey, you ain't seen no, no worse a scared rabbit since the world began than this here same Br'er Rabbit. He knowed where he come from. But he don't know where he gone. <laughs> Directly the bucket hit the water and dar she sat. And Br'er Rabbit, he's so scared he's shaking and shaking like somebody had the ague. He's scared to move because he thinks the bucket's going to keel over and knock him in the water. He don't know what minute going to be the next. Well, you know, Br'er Fox always got one eye or another on Br'er Rabbit, and he see Br'er Rabbit light out from the new ground, and so he just took off out of him. And he see him come to the well, and he see him jump in the bucket, and lo and behold, he see him going down out of sight. Well, Br'er Fox don't know what to make of that, and he sat down in the bush for to study on it. And he say, well, if that don't bang my time, then Joe's dead and Sal's a widow. I reckon, I reckon, Br'er Rabbit get his money hid in there, that's what. And if it ain't that, well, he's discovered a gold mine, that's what. 
I was going to find out. So it crop up closer and closer. They don't hear nothing. They crop up closer and closer. They don't hear no fuss. And come up to the well and he looked down in it. And he don't hear nothing. So he call out, he said, Br'er Rabbit, who you visiting down there? Well, sir, Br'er Rabbit, he's in that bucket just shivering and shaking and saying his prayers over and over and over like a train of cars running. And he hear Br'er Fox. And he say, hmm? Oh, Br'er Fox? Oh, I, I was fishing. Fishing, says Br'er Fox. Uh-huh, says Br'er Rabbit. I allowed that I was bleeds to surprise you all with a mess of fish for supper. So I was down here fishing. Well, what are you fishing for, Br'er Rabbit, says Br'er Fox. Uh, suckers, says Br'er Rabbit. I was fishing for suckers. Is there many of them down there, says Br'er Fox. Scores and scores of them, says Br'er Rabbit. The water's naturally alive with them. Come on down, Br'er Fox, and help me haul them up. Well, how's I going to get down down, says Br'er Fox. Says he, well, jump in the bucket, says Br'er Rabbit. It'll bring you down all right. Well, Br'er Rabbit, he talks so happy that Br'er Fox, he jump in the bucket. And of course, he weigh more than Br'er Rabbit, so down he go. He passed Br'er Rabbit on the halfway ground, and Br'er Rabbit hang, hung, sing out at him and say, Goodbye, Br'er Fox. Take care of your clothes, cause this is the way the old world goes. Some goes up and some goes down. You'll get to the bottom all safe and sound. Well, when Br'er Rabbit get to the top, he jump out of that bucket and he run and he tell the folks that owns the well that there's a big old fox down there muddying up the drinking water. And then he lit back to the well and he call out and he say, Br'er Fox, Br'er Fox, here come a man with a great big gun. When he haul you up, you jump and run. And then Br'er Rabbit, he lit out for the new ground. And Br'er Fox, he do just like Br'er Rabbit told him. And you know, honey, in half an hour's time, there was both of them back there on the new ground just working away like they never heard and tell her no well. Except every once in a while, <laughs> Br'er Rabbit would bust out laughing and Br'er Fox would get a spell of the dry grins. Oh, this is an English folk tale. Once upon a time, there was a poor woodcutter who worked very hard, but try as he may, try as he might, he could not get enough food to feed his children. There was nothing to do but take the three youngest with them, give them with, with him, and give them each a slice of bread and abandon them in the forest. Well, they ate their bread, and then they walked around and tried to find the way home. And it got dark, and they grew weary, and they walked and walked and walked, feeling very lost. And then far off, they saw a light, and they made for it. It was a house with lights coming out of the window. So they went up and knocked on the door, and a woman opened the door, and she said, What do you want? And they said, Oh, we're very hungry and tired. Could you give us something to eat? Oh, no, she said, You can't come in here. For my husband, my man, is a terrible giant, and he'd as soon eat you as say knife. But they begged so prettily, and they looked so wretched that at last she said, Well, Come in, and I'll give you something before he gets here. So they went in, and she gave them milk and bread, and just as they began to eat it, there was a terrible noise outside, and a banging on the door, and a voice said, Wife, wife, fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an earthly one. Who have you got in there? And she said, It's only three lassies. They're high tired and hungry, and I let them in now, and they'll go away. Now you won't hurt them. Well, he came in, and he looked at them. And he said, well, they can stay the night. 
So the giant's wife said that they were to sleep in the bed with her three lassies, for the giant had three lassies of his, of his own. Now the youngest of the three lassies that were lost was named Molly Whuppie, and she was a clever lass. She noticed that before they were all put to bed, the giant took three necklaces of gold and put one around each of the necks of his own children. But around the necks of Molly Whuppie and her two sisters, he put necklaces of straw. Well, they were all asleep, six of them in the big bed. And sure enough, in the middle of the night, the giant came in. But Molly Whuppie had worried about it before, and she got up before the giant came, and she changed over the necklaces. So it was Molly Whuppie and her sisters who were wearing the necklaces of gold, and the giant's lassies who had the necklaces of straw. And he fumbled, and he fumbled when he came, and he took out of the bed he plucked up the three straw necklaces and he put the children in a great sack and he took them down in the cellar and locked them up and he said there my dears there you'll wait till I'm ready to eat you and went back to bed but Molly Wuppie Molly Wuppie woke up